Hi, I'm Betsy Nicoletti. Thanks for joining me today to hear about behavioral health billing and coding compliance lessons from the OIG. So on March 29th, 2022, the OIG released a report about a psychiatrist in New York City. And they said that this psychiatrist didn't comply with Medicare requirements when billing for behavioral health services. And they requested $1.18 million back. How did the psychiatrist come to the OIG's attention? The psychiatrist was, quote, among the highest reimbursed individual providers in the nation. So this psychiatrist, as we read the report, provided some services personally and employed social, social workers who also provided psychotherapy. All of the services performed by the social workers were billed incident to the psychiatrist. So we know there's a financial difference there. Services that are billed under the psychiatrist's provider number incident to their service are paid at 100% of the fee schedule amount and direct billed by the social worker are paid at 75% of the fee schedule amount. So um, if the psychiatrist billed a million dollars, then 25% or $250,000, um, if they were paid a million dollars, then they would have been paid an extra $250,000 for doing it all incident to. It appears that the psychiatrist saw patients did medication management and some psychotherapy, and then sent patients to social workers for therapy. So if you download that report from the OIG, this is a chart from there, from there in which they describe the type of errors that they found where they assessed that um, there were unallowable services and deficiencies. Treatment plans didn't comply, incident two requirements weren't met, a therapist not licensed to provide services in the state, time in psychotherapy not documented, psychotherapy services not documented, and treatment plans not signed. So I'm gonna talk about each, of, each one of these. But if you've ever read one of these reports, you know that the OIG has its say, and then the, the group can respond. So the practices lawyer responded to the OIG saying that they thought the extrapolated sum was grossly overbroad and inaccurate, unwarranted, or at the very least grossly overstated, overestimated. They believe some of the things that, that they are on the rest of this slide are things that they believe that they were doing that the OIG said they weren't. So treatment plans didn't comply with Medicare requirements. They didn't contain required elements, frequency or duration of services. So a treatment plan should include the establishment of the initial diagnosis, evaluation of the patient's ability and capability to participate in psychotherapy, and the initial plan of care, and the goals for the treatment and the frequency and duration of those services. So I'm gonna come back and talk about the treatment plan again uh, when they because they also say that the treatment plans weren't signed. So the other thing they said was that services didn't comply with incident two rules. So straight from the Medicare manual, incident to a, a physician's professional service means that the services or supplies are furnished as an integral though incidental part of the physician's personal professional services in the course of diagnosis or treatment of an illness or injury. So we know if you're billing a nurse practitioner incident two, you're paid at 85% of the fee schedule amount, billing a social worker incident two, or not incident two, if you're billing a, um, a nurse practitioner or PA direct, you get paid at 85%. If you build them incident two, you get the 100%, so 15% more. For a social worker, if you build direct based on the social worker's provider number, you get paid at 75% of the physician fee schedule amount instead of 100%. So for that extra 15 or 25%, Medicare wants you to comply with the incident two rules. And they are that the physician sees the patient and initiates the course of treatment or the plan of care, that the physician has subsequent services of a frequency that reflects their continued active participation in and management of the treatment, and the physician 
And here's the kicker. The physician must be physically present in the same office suite when the service is performed, immediately available to provide help if needed. So we have one physician billing for five social workers in this practice, which is why that this individual provider was one of the highest paid Medicare providers in the nation not for services just that were personally performed, but for these services that were performed incident to. Is it realistic that the physician was in the office at all of those times, no days off, no vacation? The social workers never came in earlier or stayed later than the physician. The OIG notes that there's no log of sign in or sign out. I've never seen a log of a sign in or sign out, but, um, be sure that the appointment schedule supports the physician presence because that, is, I believe as I look at that, is one of the key reasons that they're re recouping money from this group. One of the therapists was not licensed or authorized to see patients in the state and evidently the practice believed there was an exception, but the OIG said they weren't eligible for that exception. This is an unforced error. I don't know anything about baseball, but I believe I'm using that term correctly. The time spent in psychotherapy wasn't documented. Now, any visit, any code that has time is the determining factor. Critical care, physical therapy, E&M services based on time, psychotherapy, the time has to be documented in the record. Start and stop times aren't required, but check your private payer policies and then state the time, either the start and stop or time of psychotherapy, 25 minutes. It's insufficient when the clinician selects the code and it comes up in the description, 90832, psychotherapy, 30 minutes with a patient, or sometimes that's described as 16 to 38 minutes with a patient. The clinician must personally document the time. One of those lines on the grid was that, the psychotherapy services weren't documented. And this was an instance in which the psychiatrist performed medication management and used an add-on psychotherapy code at the same encounter. Could be, a, this was a psychiatrist, but this could also be done by a psychiatric NP or PA. Specifically, the New York City provider did not provide treatment notes associated with psychotherapy sessions for services billed. Specifically, for each of the sampled beneficiary days, the New York City provider provided a treatment note for an EM session, not a subsequent psychotherapy session. So we're billing medication management and office visit and an add on psychotherapy code. And the OIG says all you sent us was the documentation for the office visit for the medication management. So we know when the psychiatrist or psychiatric NP or PA are doing that, they must select the e &M code based on medical decision-making, the number of conditions assessed and treated and their status. And then, and this is an old slide um, that I put in here, after medication management, X minutes spent in psychotherapy and then document the psychotherapy session with patient-centered details, the type of therapy, patient's response, goals, progress towards attaining the goals. It's, you want, um, the OIG appears to be looking for a second note. Now this was, is not required by either CPT or CMS, but you have to document the psychotherapy. So you, you have the E&M service documented for medication management, after medication management, psychotherapy was performed or a new section, psychotherapy note, and then document it. Patient-centered detail in the description of the psychotherapy, description of the interaction with the patients and the patient's response to treatment. You wanna make sure you have that. Specific interventions and advice given, goals and progress towards those goals. And avoid, all psychotherapy is 16 minutes long. 16 minutes of supportive psychotherapy was provided or goals that are generic or not patient specific. Remember you're being paid for two services, for an office visit 
and for psychotherapy, the add-on code. And you wanna make sure that your psychotherapy note is of the same quality and quantity as a standalone psychotherapy code. It should be the same. It should look similar to a standalone psychotherapy note. So I, I've worked with clients where I didn't think we had that second, quite that second detail and have uh, given them this advice going forward. Treatment plans not signed. Now here's a word I want you to notice. Medicare guidance. I hope their legal team is um, responding to Medicare guidance rather than Medicare requirements. It is a requirement that if you're billing incident to the physicians in the suite of office when the service is performed. But guidance here, Medicare guidance states that services provided be authenticated by the individual responsible for the care of the patient. For 96 of 100 beneficiary days, the New York City provider did not maintain signature pages for the associated beneficiaries treatment plans. Signature pages? When did that become a requirement? But they're talking about a treatment plan here. Therefore, we could not verify that the beneficiary's treatment plans were signed by the treating physician, which may have resulted in inappropriate or unnecessary treatments. So this is me reading between the lines. The physician, the psychiatrist saw the patient, maybe started the patient on medication and referred the patient to the social worker in their own practice and signed that note. The social worker put together a treatment plan. I am confident that the social worker signed the treatment plan. But since these were bill incident to the physician, it appears the OIG wants a physician signature. That is the only way I can, I can interpret that. So uh, come back to our chart about the type of deficiencies that the OIG found. Uh, once when I was in a presentation, I asked, how do we decrease our Medicare risk? And a surgeon in the back, there's always one in the back, says, don't bill Medicare. Wasn't the answer I was looking for, and it's not the one I suggest. How we minimize our risk is to make sure we're following Medicare and coding rules and to take to heart the type of deficiencies that the OIG found and uh, to do a self audit of your records to make sure that your records don't have these type of deficiencies. And I'm using the OIG word for this for in your records. You know, I always think of um, too much encoding depends on the framework of the situation. So I'm sure from the practices perspective, they were providing needed medically necessary care for their patients. From the OIG's perspective, they were collecting money they weren't entitled to collect. So the lesson that we need to learn is that we should do a self audit of our records if we're in behavioral health of these issues, if you're in a different specialty, but you bill incident two of the incident two issues and make sure that you're not making these same kinds of errors. Thanks very much. My name is Betsy Nicoletti and I appreciate the time you spent talking, listening to me today.